Welcome back, I'm Matt Chemist, and today we'll be deciding which chemistry resource is the most useful. Developing a background in chemistry is helpful for understanding the world around us. Unfortunately, textbooks and course materials from high school and university are far from sufficient. One of the biggest problems is the absence of proper references in textbooks, which makes it difficult to develop an integrated understanding of chemistry, and science broadly speaking. Whether you are a chemistry student, a researcher, or just a science enthusiast, this video will summarize and rank some of the best chemistry resources available. This list will primarily focus on free resources, especially ones online, but I will include some paid resources which researchers frequently have access to through their company or university. If you're a university student, there's also a good chance that you'll have access to some of these as well. Depending on where your inquiry takes you, some of these resources will be more or less helpful at different points in time. So without further ado, let's get started. The first resource we're going to be discussing is Wikipedia. You probably already know that Wikipedia is useful, but if you didn't know that, it's one of the main things that you're going to be using when you're trying to find out some basic information about essentially any chemical. One example that I'll show here is the Grignard reaction. Wikipedia has a whole article about Grignard reagents, explaining what they are, how they work, and what sort of chemical reactions you can accomplish. The one downside of Wikipedia is that some of the articles will be really clear and thorough, while some other chemicals may not even have a Wikipedia page. So it's a good starting point, but it might not have all of the information that you need. Of course, it's beneficial that Wikipedia is free, and you can usually find an article about most chemicals you'd be interested in. So for that reason, I think we can put Wikipedia into S tier. Another resource that's somewhat helpful when you're trying to find out some more information about chemicals is PubChem. PubChem shows you all sorts of information on various chemicals. For instance, if you're trying to find its chemical abstract service number or CAS number, which are assigned to essentially all chemicals, one of the easiest places to find those are on PubChem, if they're not available on Wikipedia. You can also see some additional information surrounding the molecule. In this case, we're looking at trifluorotoluene, also known as benzotrifluoride, and you have some information right at your disposal, which can be a little bit helpful. I personally don't use PubChem a ton, but I know a lot of less experienced chemists find a lot of value in this. So for me, I think I'm gonna to have to rank PubChem into like C tier, C for chem. Now let's say that you don't know too much about chemistry and you don't have a textbook at your disposal. Well, there's a nice solution to that as well, Chemistry Libre Texts. Chemistry Libre Texts has essentially online free books which explain chemistry in different fields, including introductory chemistry, general chemistry, organic chemistry, and inorganic chemistry, just to name a few. Let's say you want to have a better understanding of polar covalent bonds, acids and bases. They have a lot of helpful information which might help you navigate the complex world that is chemistry. Resources like this can be especially helpful early on. So because it's free and it's also a textbook and it's online, that's pretty awesome. So for that reason, we're going to put Chemistry Libre Texts also into S tier. Another resource that I relatively recently became aware of is PubPeer. PubPeer is a way for researchers to hold other researchers accountable. For example, there is this one paper from Lauro Figueroa Valverde, which longtime viewers of the channel may be familiar with. For example, one reader took issue with the fact that, for the ethics approval section of this paper, it simply said, yes. And surprisingly, Lauro Figueroa Valverde actually responded, but as you can see, he wasn't willing to give this information until they essentially doxed themselves. This one author has numerous extremely concerning papers, which is why we've made some videos covering his work in the past. But PubPeer is a nice way for you as a researcher to check if any other previous researchers have taken issue with a specific paper. Maybe you're trying to reproduce a chemical reaction in your own research, and it's just not working. So you decide to paste in the DOI, the digital object identifier, into PubPeer, and just see if anyone else has taken issue with it. If no one else has, this might be your time to shine. PubPeer is a way to keep scientists accountable, and it's also a way to make sure that you're not going crazy if your chemistry isn't working. While this hasn't been widely adopted yet, the absence of comment sections on journal websites means that you can't essentially have post-publication review, which is pretty important, especially if there's major concerns with research. So PubPeer is a way to leave comments on papers, even though the journals don't let you do that on their own websites. So this is a way to get around the publishers, and try and maintain the integrity of science, which is pretty based. So for that reason, we'll put PubPeer into A tier. A for ain't gonna get away with it this time, Figueroa. 
The next two are Reaxis and SciFinder. These are both paid resources which are extremely important for synthetic chemists. Both of these websites offer a range of information, such as a very large library of different chemicals that have been synthesized previously, linking to the published papers giving you all of the bibliographical information, as well as information about the chemicals involved with each reaction. This is only scratching the surface of some of the features that both of these platforms have to offer, and Reaxis has been one of the main sponsors for our channel in the past. They're not sponsoring this video, but I thought I'd mention that here because they've been supporting our important paper series, which is pretty awesome. However, since these are both paid resources, I don't think it's fair to put them into S tier, even though they would be one of the first places that I would go when I'm looking for information in the scientific literature. So for that reason, we'll put Reaxis into A tier, and because SciFinder doesn't sponsor the channel, we'll put them into B tier. I think it makes sense for us to put SciFinder into B tier, because its logo kind of looks like a cursed letter B. The next resource of note is the Chemical Rubber Company Handbook. This has a lot of physical constants for tons of different chemicals that you might be looking for information about. Some of this information is poorly indexed online in freely available form, so these resources can be a way to get the information you're looking for despite that. There's been very many volumes of this book produced, and it contains information such as how certain reactions work, such as named reactions, and it's just generally a good resource, especially leaning towards people working in the physical sciences. I personally don't open this one very often, but early on when I was still a young researcher, it did teach me about some reactions that I hadn't learned about previously. Since it's the CRC handbook, I think we can put it into C tier. C for CRC. One of my favorite resources is Mayer's database of reactivity parameters. When you're trying to develop an understanding of nucleophiles and electrophiles in organic chemistry, it can be confusing because it's not always clear which would be more reactive. For example, let's see what's more nucleophilic triethylamine or trimethylamine. They let you sort groups of nucleophiles based on their class, and you can even filter by reactivity parameters. Something with a really low parameter number means that it kinetically happens very slowly, but if it has a really high number, that means that it's a smoking hot nucleophile. So here you can see trimethylamine has a nucleophilicity parameter of 23, but if we go down further, triethylamine only has a nucleophilicity of 17.3. Although this is in a different solvent, you can still see that there's six units of difference, which actually corresponds to a nucleophilicity difference of approximately 10 to the 6. That's a million times more nucleophilic. While you might think, oh, they're both tertiary amines, they're both going to react similarly. That's not necessarily the case, because trimethylamine is a much better nucleophile. So for Mayer's nucleophilicity parameters, I think that they're super powerful for people and they're freely available in this online resource. This is also going to have to go right into S tier. When you're trying to learn more about obscure reactions or ways to couple stuff in chemistry, such as in the synthesis of esters or amides, one of the places that you might want to look at is Organic Chemistry Portal, OCP. OCP has information about lots of different named reactions, and here I've just shown Barton decarboxylation as one example. They show you the rough overall reaction, and they show you examples of papers where different sorts of chemistry of the type described have been done. One of the most useful features for me from Organic Chemistry Portal is the stability data for protecting groups. Oftentimes when you're doing organic synthesis, you need to put protecting groups on a molecule so that you're able to do chemistry on other parts of the molecule. So if you're not sure, for instance, if this thalamide group would be deprotected under some reaction conditions, you can see what the relative stability is in various conditions. So you might, for instance, not know that you could use sodium borohydride and it wouldn't affect a thalamide group, but now you know. So this is a useful way to understand the stability of different protecting groups. Useful resource. If you're ever interested in finding out more, I'd highly encourage you to check out this resource. Organic Chemistry Portal. You need to update your graphical user interface because it looks pretty bad, but other than that, it's definitely got to be S tier. Google Patents. While you might not think that patents are always the best source of information, patents can be a really good way to find a procedure for you to synthesize a specific chemical. These aren't always present on Wikipedia, and they're not always readily available through Google searches, but if you're using a resource like Reaxis or SciFinder, you can get the patent number and then search in Google Patents for said number. There are other ways to search for patents, but for me, I just find it easiest to use Google Patents. You can also download the PDF of the patent in the original language. In this case, it wouldn't be super helpful unless you can read Chinese. If you're a chemist, you can usually still read organic chemistry. So here we start with salicylic acid, ethanol, and 4-methylbenzene sulfonic acid in the presence of sodium carbonate enables the synthesis of ethyl salicylate. I don't need to understand Chinese to get that part, 
but you could also use a program like Google Translate to quickly translate this into a language you can read. Google Patents is okay, but I think it's probably like a D tier resource overall. Since you can't usually get high quality information in English always, but nonetheless, it still comes in handy from time to time. Another slightly useful one is Google Scholar. The main case where I would use Google Scholar is for trying to find more research papers from the same author. So if a specific author that you're looking for has a Google Scholar page, you can see what their most cited articles are, and maybe they've published some interesting chemistry similar to the stuff that you're working on. Google Scholar can also be used for finding some articles, especially since lots of articles are now mandated to be available online. So Google Scholar can help you find those articles even when the papers on the publisher's websites might still say that there's a paywall. So that's pretty awesome. Overall, still pretty mid utility, so I'll put Google Scholar into D tier. Let's say you don't have ChemDraw or some other paid software that lets you get 3D images of the molecules that you're working on. A great free resource is MoleView. MoleView will let you make a two-dimensional structure and you can convert it into a three-dimensional structure. You can see what a molecule might look like, but this isn't necessarily the lowest energy state of this molecule. This is just a rough estimate of what the 3D structure would look like. But if you wanted to download this, let's say for a lab report or for a presentation, you can download this image as a 3D model or as a mole file if you want to manipulate it in some other software. Look at that, it's our molecule. I personally don't use MoleView very often, but if I had known about it when I was an undergrad, I would have definitely been putting more three-dimensional structures in my lab reports. So MoleView, it's free, it's pretty simple. For that reason, I think we can put it into B tier. B for better lab reports, baby. We already mentioned Wikipedia once, but it turns out that Wikipedia has a chemical structure explorer. You can put a structure down and you'll start seeing search results right away. This could be a potentially useful way for you to search through chemicals that might not be well indexed because they have complex names. So if you can draw the thing you're looking for but you don't know what it's called, this might be a helpful tool for you, which is free. Because I can't easily draw the lines exactly where I want even when I hover over the bonds every time, that makes me dislike this a little bit more, but it is easy to find the name of chemicals you might not be familiar with. It links you right to the Wikipedia page without having to go to a whole separate tab, so I guess that's kind of interesting. Let me know if you think that this one's as useful as it appears. I'll put this one into the same tier as Wikipedia, since it still falls under the same umbrella. Almonds Encyclopedia. In my opinion, Almonds is probably by far the best chemistry resource available. It tells you how the majority of chemicals are made, at least the relevant ones, which are produced industrially at an enormous scale. If things are prepared through multiple processes, there's typically discussions of that. For example, here we have the synthesis of sucralose. It gives context surrounding its discovery. It also gives the cast number of these molecules, solubility information, and an overall reaction scheme describing its synthesis. This sort of thing can be really useful if you just need context about a chemical that you aren't able to find other good information about online. Ullman's Encyclopedia is one of the resources I wished I found out about as soon as I started studying chemistry. So if you haven't heard of it before and you think chemistry might be interesting for you, I'd highly encourage you to check it out. Ullman's Encyclopedia, solid S tier. S for, I bet you didn't see how many pages there were in that document, yikes. If you don't have a good computer, maybe buy a physical copy of that one, but it is a bit pricey, so maybe you can find a PDF. A resource that's often taught about in undergrad teaching labs is SDBS, the Spectral Database for Organic Compounds. Unfortunately, at the time of recording, SDBS is undergoing maintenance, but this is a website that lets you search for IR and NMR spectra for a lot of different chemicals. Here are some old pictures showing what the old user interface used to look like, where you could put in the compound name, molecular formula, molecular weight, essentially whatever information you have about the molecule or unknown that you're working with. You don't always have all the information when you're searching for spectra, so you might be trying to find a match for something that you already have an experimental spectrum for. You could even put in the IR peaks from an IR spectrum and then get a result of what possible compounds it could be. The one thing I'll mention though is this isn't a comprehensive database, they don't have every chemical under the sun, but they do have quite an extensive library, which has come in handy numerous times for myself. Once you submit a query, it shows you what different information is available for each compound which is similar to your search. This is an example of what you could expect to see. This is the IR spectrum of acetic acid. SDBS is pretty useful, but its intermittent availability definitely limits its overall utility. Heck, I couldn't even show you how it works for this video and it's July when they said that they had planned to reopen. This isn't the first time that SDBS has been down for me before. It has long periods of outages, which is definitely disappointing, 
as when you rely on something, you want to be able to consistently rely on it. So for that reason, we'll put it into C tier, but if they got more reliable, it could be a solid B or an A tier. If you're trying to understand acidity and you're not satisfied with any explanation and you really want to know experimental values for pKa's, which is the acidity of different hydrogens in a molecule, the Bordwell pKa is the resource for you. The Bordwell pKa table breaks down different chemicals into their groups and it displays what the pKa of that sort of proton would be. It contains a lot of heterocycles and complex motifs that you might not see too too often, but when you want to know what the pKa of imidazole is, this would be one way to quickly go and get that information. It isn't complete, but nonetheless it has a lot of pKa values which are hard to find in other places. They can be found, but oftentimes these values are just reported in specific research papers. But what the Boardwell pKa table has done is it's aggregated all of that information into one place so that it can be used. Boardwell pKa table can go right into A tier, A for pKa. The Merck Index is another resource kind of like the Chemical Rubber Company Handbook, which is an authoritative reference work widely used in the fields of chemistry, biology, and pharmacology providing detailed information on chemicals, drugs, and biologicals, including their properties, uses, and safety profiles. It serves as a valuable resource for professionals and researchers for accurate and comprehensive chemical data. So overall, I think it's about as good as the Chemical Rubber Company Handbook, so we'll put it right in between B tier and C tier, since it's slightly better than the CRC Handbook. If you're a synthetic chemist, you'll be super familiar with organic syntheses, this is one of the best journals that publishes procedures that are essentially always reproducible. The way that organic syntheses works is when an author submits a publication, before it can be published, checkers, which are scientists who will test this chemistry, will go to their own labs, buy their own materials, and see if they can reproduce the chemistry that was reported in the yields that were reported. Because this is part of the whole publication process, organic syntheses has developed a really good reputation in terms of reproducibility, since people literally have to reproduce it before it can even be published. The downside is you'd essentially be looking for the preparation of a single molecule in some past article on here. So it doesn't have everything, but if you can find a procedure for the chemical that you're trying to make on organic syntheses, you can trust that the procedure will work. That doesn't mean that it's the best procedure for you to follow necessarily, because some of the old papers will use dangerous reagents that are harsh and potentially toxic, so you may not want to follow some of the really old procedures. Nonetheless, if you do decide to reproduce them, you can have a high level of confidence that it should work, and you should get yields comparable to the reported yields. So Orgsyn is a great resource, we're going to put it right into S tier, which is appropriate. S for synthesis. The NIST, which stands for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, have various pieces of chemical information for different molecules of note. For example, here we have ozone. You can see what sort of different available information there is, and for me, it's a useful way to find IR spectrum in a pinch. It's freely available, so if you're working on a lab report, for instance, when you're in a chemistry lab, this might be a way for you to quickly get a spectrum for comparison. Depending on what sort of work you're doing, this will have different utility, but overall, the NIST is a pretty decent resource. So for that reason, we'll put it into A tier. You might not have heard of a nomograph before, but Ligma Baldrich has a nomograph that you can use to predict the boiling point of a chemical at a different pressure. Let's say we have a chemical with a boiling point of 200. Let's lock that in place. That's what its boiling point would be at 1 atm at atmospheric pressure, but if we wanted the chemical to boil at 50 degrees Celsius, we could see what necessary pressure we would have to achieve. In this case, we would have to do a reduced pressure distillation at 2.3 millimeters of mercury, also known as 2.3 tor, in order to achieve that low of a boiling point. This is helpful when you're trying to distill high boiling point liquids and you want to predict what their boiling point will be at reduced pressure. This is a pretty useful resource and I'm not familiar with any other online versions like this. The one downside is it's from Ligma Baldrich, but it is freely available, so we'll put it into C tier because it's useful very selectively in a very specific context but it still has its place on this tier list. Another one of the best resources in chemistry, especially organic chemistry, is Not Voodoo X. Not Voodoo X is from the University of Rochester, and they have a lot of different information depending on what sort of level you're at. For example, they have different TLC stains, which often work quite well. If you're looking for how to quench a reaction, they have the Pfizer workup, which describes how you can quench lithium aluminum hydride in a safe manner. This is one of the most common ways to quench lithium aluminum hydride, and they just have all of this information for you freely available. They also have tips and tricks if you're struggling in the lab, 
So there's different value depending on what sort of work you're doing. One of my favorite ones for entertainment purposes is rookie mistakes. If you work in a lab, you'll find this super relatable. Mistake, didn't check for cracks on clips for Rotovap or didn't use a clip. When vacuum is switched on, flask containing precious compound drops in bath. If you don't put a clip on your flask and you start rotating, if there isn't a vacuum, this can just fall right off. A lot of people had that happen. I guess I've had that happen as well, so I should vote. Not Voodoo X probably could have a video of its own just because of how many different useful things there are. One last one that I want to mention is should I buy it or make it myself? There's different chemicals on here and essentially researchers will vote whether they say make it or buy it. Generally you prefer to buy a chemical as a chemist because otherwise you're wasting your time. But there are some chemicals that are definitely better when you prepare them fresh. If you have an opinion about some of these chemicals, make sure you come here and vote. And if some of your chemistry isn't working, maybe you need to make it instead. Not Voodoo X, one of the best resources on this list, can also go right into S tier. EROS is the Encyclopedia of Reagents for Organic Synthesis. It includes a lot of different information regarding specific chemicals. For example, this is acetic formic anhydride, and it describes how it's prepared and what sorts of different reactions it's been used for in the past. It's not a comprehensive review article, but it shows you a bunch of the different chemistry that can be accomplished with specific reagents. While E. E. Ross doesn't have every chemical under the sun, it still contains a lot of different chemicals, which are brief but useful, describing how the chemical has been used in the past. Oftentimes they have newer additions which can provide more insight, and overall it's one of the first places I would look at when trying to understand how a reagent's been used in the past. This has got to be another solid S tier, which is appropriate. S for E. Ross. Now, let's say you want to get access to a paper, but your university doesn't have access to that journal, or maybe you're not in a university at all. While a lot of public funding mandates are gradually making articles freely available, in the meantime, you still want to be educated and you want to get access to information. One way to do that is with Sci-Hub, which enables you to access articles that would normally be behind a paywall. If you choose to use Sci-Hub, you'll get educated a lot faster, I think the only people who are really opposed to Sci-Hub are the publishers themselves. Because for me, the priority is science, we're going to put Sci-Hub into S tier. S for science. The different ways you can use Sci-Hub are you can just paste in the whole DOI, digital object identifier, of the article you're looking for here. You can also paste it in as part of the URL, or sometimes you can even just post the entire URL of whatever article you're trying to access. It generally doesn't work for articles beyond 2021, but it works for older articles quite well. If you're looking for a PDF of a book, similar to Sci-Hub, we have Libgen. This speaks for itself, and if you search the ISBN numbers or the titles of the book, you can quite often find a lot of books on there. It's worth a shot if you can't find a book or if you can't afford textbooks. Again, because this is enabling education, we're going to put it into A tier. I would say that Sci-Hub has had more success for me more reliably than Libgen has, but there's a lot of really important books that you can find on Libgen. Last but not least, we have two different applications, Chemistry by Design and Reaction Flash. Chemistry by Design is an app, but you can also use it in browser. Let's pick a chemical compound such as actinobolin, and we can view the sequence of how it was synthesized. It was synthesized from quinic acid with diacetyl in the presence of triethyl formate and camphor sulfonic acid in ethanol. This provided this product in 97% yield. The next step is shown here, where a sodium borohydride reduction has occurred. So essentially, what this app does is it lets you see different synthetic schemes, especially for natural products. This is another really helpful way to learn different chemical reactions and in what contexts they might be used. This is another really useful app. It's free, so we'll put it right into A tier. Reaction Flash is another app produced by Reaxis. It's also free and it's on the App Store and Google Play Store, and it lists over 1,200 named reactions in organic chemistry. It shows you examples of what those chemical reactions are in peer-reviewed literature, and it even lets you click a link to go to those articles directly. I use this app to learn about a lot more reactions, especially when I would be picking up my wife from work. It even works without having an internet connection, which was a huge selling feature for me, because I didn't have data at the time. So if you're trying to learn about more reactions or just step up your research game, Reaction Flash is another great one as well. It's free, but S tier is pretty full, so we'll put it right in between S tier and A tier. This is by no means a comprehensive list of all of the different chemistry resources available, but I hope that this has taught you about some resources which will help you out on your chemistry voyage. 
If there's any useful ones that I missed, make sure to drop a comment down below so that people can use them as well. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.